Take this. Now I gotta turn my back. Thirty-two hundred bucks. That's what he gave me. Thirty-two hundred bucks for a lifetime. Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. Now I watched a video on Purchase Channel. I don't get a lot of time to watch other uh, YouTube comic book videos, but today I saw one that I thought was interesting. It was something like, uh, "What if, you know, what if comic books are aimed at, at older white readers?" Well, that sounds seems like an interesting, an enticing topic. What's Perch going to say about that? When I went in there and listened to his uh, his video, I thought it was very interesting. And it had my mind percolating that uh, he made some very good points. And I think uh, you can go deeper on something like this. That some of the fallout, what I call, or what we would call when I was in intelligence, second, third, fourth order effects. When you make decisions and then the ramifications, the, the unseen um, things, that, the, the fallout that you never expected. And a lot of times they're far worse than the, the problem that you're trying to solve. You learn that one over and over and over especially with, if you ever pay attention to, to government intervention. Almost undoubtedly, every time they intervene on something, they end up making three or four things a billion times worse than the original problem ever was because these are things that you don't anticipate. But what, if you think about them, you can see how these things would happen. And a lot of what he was talking in there is, is um, you know, if comic books always were geared toward old white men, which obviously they weren't, uh, specifically at least up into the 90s, they were they were aimed at children for the most part. They decided to change their audience. We're going to have a very interesting discussion on Thursday with Gervais Dargan on uh, our It's Complicated uh, conversation. We're going to talk about comic books this time, about how these things kind of all happen within the 90s and um, how they're kind of trying to, to court new audiences and whether or not it's a good thing. Here's the spoiler. It is a good thing. They just don't know what they're doing. But if that's what comic books always were, that's not the comic reader's fault. It's not my fault. It's not even really the uh, the comic creator's fault. It's really the executives and the editors. It's the people that drive the agenda, that, that decide what books are going to be greenlit, what stories get to go forward and whatnot. They are the ones pushing the agendas. They're the ones pushing the comic books out to the store. And if they were always for older white people, well, it's their fault. Why are you talking to me about it? You know, the, you got one point, finger, one finger pointing at me, and four of them pointing back at you. Well, I guess three, three point back at you because <laughs> these are your decisions, not mine. I buy what comic books I'm interested in or what's on the shelf. You know, whether whether the the creative team is diverse has never ever come into my mind is whether is that being a selling factor. I've never. I've never gone to a comic book and I said, you know what? I got money for one comic book. I got two options here. They're gonna they're in a tie. Which one has the most diverse creative team? I've never, it's never even entered my mind. I imagine, really, it's probably never entered ninety five percent of comic book readers' minds, no matter what their color, uh, or what their ethnicity is, what their race, religion, sexuality, any of that, gender. I don't think people give a shit about stuff like that. What's the main character? Is the co is the cover cool? Have I been reading this already? Is this a story I'm interested in completing? Kind of stuff. That's those are the factors that come into this. But nowadays, if you want to get internet clout, you want to get big clapbacks, or if you want to get any kind of coverage within mainstream media, you know, you can't. I don't know, you could do a death of Batman and it would certainly get covered, but you would also have to kill off Bruce Wayne to do it, right? You can't kill the Golden, golden Goose. I just talked yesterday or, uh, or the day before about how uh, DC Comics is trying to make me hate Batman by re releasing so many comics. They're completely uh, you know, uh, addicted to Bruce Wayne and his associated characters. But if you did a you know death of Batman or something like that, you would certainly get, get a lot of mainstream coverage. They can't do something like that. You can't go back to the death of Superman well too often. So they um, they oftentimes they have to to lean into I don't know movements pressure that's coming from social media and whatnot, and then they make a big deal about it, which is fine. You know, hey, whatever it is that you have to do to market your comic books to get them to sell, but in doing so, along the way they've they've started 
casting the writers based on the same like surface traits a lot of, of a lot of their characters whether it be their ethnicity um the gender of the character uh the sexuality of the character and obviously not all those are are surface traits but these uh, traits that, that people have, like you can't change those. Those are just the traits of who you are. And they never really seem to take in consideration, does this writer have the best pitch for this character? Is this the writer that knows the character the best? Uh, you know, what are their qualifications for this? I just talked about this a couple of weeks ago with Rebecca Roanhorse when uh, she was interviewed about doing that uh, Echo story. And they said, did, did you have this, this story lined up? And she goes, no. Marvel approached me about it, and they wanted me to write this. So I said I would. Well, obviously, it's a paying gig. You know, being a writer, unless you're Stephen King or something like that, probably is the most lucrative career in the world. So uh, you, you got to take your money where you can get it. But it wasn't that um, Rebecca Roanhorse had the world's best pitch for Echo. It's because Rebecca Roanhorse had the correct, uh, you know, ethnicity that lined up with the character. Now, would Rebecca Roanhorse end up being some, uh, you know, the, the next Ed Ascenti or um, the, the next Chuck Dixon, like great comic book writer? I have no idea. Based on what I read in, um, in Phoenix Song Echo number one, absolutely not. I think uh, Doc and I are actually going to review issue number two in our worst, uh, worst of the week roast segment. I have a feeling that that one's not going to be very good. But in doing these things and wanting to, uh, you know, I don't know, virtue signal <laughs> these great accomplishments that they're changing the industry, even though they were likely they being the the, uh, the the people in charge were likely the ones that were the impediment. If these things weren't allowed to happen in the, the begin with, it wasn't the customers, it wasn't the creators, it was the leadership and the people in decision making um, physicians that made these decisions and on who was writing what what stories were being released to, to show that they are fixing the problem that apparently is with the customers <laughs> or we buy the comic center out there whether it has a good comic book cover or whatever that's what kind of sells these things so we're to blame so in order to virtue signal that they are they're changing the comic book industry it's not going to be just for white folks anymore and it certainly has not ever just been for white folks um i think for the most part, comic books have been ahead of the curve as far as the entertainment industry, but that's another video. They've gone through and ruined essentially an entire generation of comic book writers. And they've tried to do it to a few other creators uh, that it did not take. One specifically we'll talk about that I, I was impervious to this and was able to see what Marvel and DC were doing, didn't want any part of it, and decided to go and pave his own path. And much to to to, this, to the betterment of his career is obviously uh, Christopher Priest. He saw that Marvel and DC were trying to pigeonhole him into being the guy that writes black superheroes. And certainly that's it's work. He has a very memorable run on Black Panther, and he's certainly done some other characters. Uh, got his start, I believe, over at uh, at Milestone when he was was it uh, James Allen. Something like that. I don't, I don't know the, the guy's entire history, but certainly he started out with, with characters that were being portrayed in Milestone, got a, some notoriety in Black Panther and other works. They tried to pigeonhole him, and he said, fuck you. I don't want to be pigeonholed. I don't want to be the guy that can only write uh, black superheroes. And he wouldn't. He did not accept it. Eventually, he got a, a pretty damn solid run on Deathstroke. If you have not read his Deathstroke from uh, DC that came with Rebirth, it's very good. I also think his Justice League is criminally underrated, also during Rebirth, and now he's working on Vampirella. If he had accepted being pigeonholed essentially by DC and comics, DC and Marvel uh, leadership and editorial, so they could uh, you know get the right uh, characteristics you know associated with the right characters. He wouldn't be able to do stuff like this right now. He obviously saw what was happening, and he said, no mas. It's not, that shit ain't happening. Not on my watch. And he went and uh, did his own thing. And he ended up creating his own opportunities. Now, there are other creators, and we'll talk about another older creator that has been pigeonholed, allowed it to kind of ha happen to himself, and has been kind of fucked over by it. And then we'll talk about some of the newer writers that um, 
you know, they've kind of been screwed over by this whole deal. But Greg Pak, when you think about his work on Hulk, prior to Immortal Hulk, and I don't know that Immortal Hulk is going to go down as one of the greatest Hulk stories of all time, but it was probably the best Hulk story since Planet Hulk, probably the most uh, acclaimed probably the highest quality, at least for the first 20, 23 issues. I think it was really good. I think it fell off after that, personally. I've heard that it picks up uh, somewhere in the middle, but at, at some point, if you, if you if you throw me off your run, I ain't coming back, especially if you're an Al Ewan. You, you only get so many. You don't get as many uh, forgiveness. I forgive you as other writers when you're kind of a dickhead. But Greg Pak you know, used to be a big name. He seemed like somebody that he could have been a contender, right? He has an all-time classic story associated with the Hulk. Not everybody can write the Hulk well. And he did something that was groundbreaking with the character. Now, specifically at Marvel Comics, he can only write Asian superheroes now. And apparently Darth Vader. That's all he's allowed to write. He wasn't allowed to write Hulk again until there was an Asian Hulk, Amadeus Cho. And whenever they're going to do uh, their work with, what is it, Agents of Atlas, Greg Pak can actually go work. And he's he's essentially been pigeonholed. And he's, you know, kind of lost opportunities, specifically at the big two, where where normally you would expect him to, to be able to kind of uh, maybe not go wherever he wanted, but go work on other characters. But now he can't because he, he accepted what Christopher Priest said no to. And he accepted the pigeonholing, even though when you look at his resume, he's got something on there that a vast majority of other writers that can work on whatever they want do not have on there. He's got an all-time classic. He's got something that put asses in seats and continues to put asses in seats and will likely be in print for the next 50 years. Plan it all. And then so we've got this new generation that have been brought in after these people, uh, Christopher Priest, Greg Pocken, and others. And they know nothing. They don't know another system, right? You get you get it. We find out, you know, you know, what what's 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 your ethnicity, what's your gender, what's your or gender identity identity, what's your sexuality, and we will we will align you up with a character that we think fits you, especially if you are not you know, good. <laughs> No offense, a white white crate. This mostly affects, not mostly, this affects POC creators, uh, creators w- with different gender identities and just male, female, and then uh, creators, as, well, this would fall into that too, but like LGBTQ creators. What the, the publishers have done, what the leadership have done, specifically, to spotlight these creators is absolutely affect, uh, affecting them and their ability to grow as creators and writers and new opportunities. They're, they're kind of shut out. One writer that they brought in under the pretense of this, uh, this idea that you, you can match up somebody that says they want to be a writer with a character based on like surface traits or whatnot is in Eve Ewing. Shockingly, if you go read her Riri Williams stuff, she is a competent writer. And it felt like, or it appeared, that that Eve Ewing had some had great potential as a comic book writer. Figured kind of figured out the formula. Like this is, you know, you need to elevate your, your character, you need to put them through some trials, tribulations, you need to win in the end. It, don't make them super grating, don't make them annoying. You want them to look heroic, and people should be rooting for them to be be the winning at the end. Nobody had really done with that with, with Riri Williams prior to her. Eve Ewing's nowhere to be found. Now, I don't think that's because Marvel discarded her. I think Eve Ewing discarded Marvel when she figured out, I'm never going to be able to write anything that isn't led by you know, a, a female black superhero in the future. Oh, I can do, do, uh, I can do Riri Williams and I can do Champions. What about Spider-Man? Or what about another character? And to be limited in that, it feels like Eve Ewing, uh, a pretty competent writer who looked like they had a bright future, probably can write in other mediums. 
uh, said, I don't need this and I don't need you. <laughs> Go fuck yourselves and I'm going to move on with my life. Maybe she'll do um, some more creator owned independent stuff in the future. But Eve, Eve Ewing is one of the few success stories it felt like Marvel Comics had. But as as being someone that actually had uh, some high potential and in, in knew how to write stories, was able to say, say la vie, I don't want this. Some of the other creators that have been less fortunate, and I'm not going to go through an enormous list, but I'll go through a, through a few here, like a scene of grace. Marvel Comics, you know, essentially torpedoed Cedar Grace's career with that Iceman book. And then further torpedoed Cedar Grace's career with the second Iceman book. And I've heard, and I have not verified this, I, I've heard it from a, a source or two, that the original Cedar Grace Iceman pitches are far different than what was actually uh, ended up being published that they had a lot more to do with superhero uh, uh, and whatnot and and far less to do with the sexual awakening of uh, of Bobby Drake and that the actual Marvel editorials team were, was were, were receiving the scripts and saying we need you to push this more and essentially ruined Cena Grace's reputation. No matter what Cena Grace does for the rest of, of his comic book writing career, he will always sit with the stigma of those Iceman comics sitting over him. There are a lot of readers, no matter what, when they see Cena Grace's book on the, on the, on the cover, they are apprehensive. Let's say you buy that Green Lantern, Lantern Annual. And that's a bad example because the Cena Grace story in there is absolutely atrocious. But once you buy that Green Lantern annual, I was definitely in this um, in this in this uh, situation. You see that name, and then you're like, "Oh, well, there's one bad story guaranteed." It just so happened it, it was bad there. Cena Grace has actually written some pretty decent stuff otherwise, in some other places. That that one just turned out to be atrocious. No matter what Cena Grace does for the rest of his career. Always over his head is hanging over him like a dark cloud will be that Iceman story that that Marvel Comics, their leadership, their editorial staff absolutely torpedoed his career with. I'm not going to blame Brian Michael Bendis. He's the one that came up with the idea. I don't think he had anything to do with the, uh, the follow up or Cena Grace getting on that book. You know, and, and that limits Cena Grace's earning potential for the rest of his his life. You know, in the comic book industry, because of that story, and there's no getting around it. He will never ever be able to to shake that demon. Now, he certainly wrote it. I'm told. You know, the editorial staff did him no favors, and perhaps putting putting Cena Grace on a character he's so personally aligned with wasn't the best choice for the writer or the character that maybe um i don't know it could get complicated you know what i'm saying another creator that's really interesting is sophie campbell now sophie campbell is writing um tmnt sophie campbell is a is a trans woman writer artist fantastic comic book artist as soon as sophie campbell took over as the artist on tmnt for iadw the art quality went way up because it turns out, well, it didn't turn out. We already knew that Sophie Campbell was a better artist than the artist they had working on uh, TMNT prior. And Sophie Campbell's done some fine work uh, in, you know, in their previous career, you know, working with TMNT and other characters. But for some reason, with the uh, with this TMNT following City at War, they decided they wanted to use this new female turtle character and all the this mutant town as like a trans allegory well that aligns pretty close to sophie campbell's actual real life experience so instead of being a teenage mutant ninja turtles book it's been you know the character progression of um i can't remember the name, name of the character anymore i'm so tired of it i haven't even read a tmnt book in like a year now because it's so bad 
Sophie Campbell is a perfectly good writer. Sophie Campbell is a great artist. Choosing to put Sophie Campbell on this book to tell this story has not been healthy for TMNT, and it's certainly not been healthy for the career of Sophie Campbell. I'm sure they're getting uh, some pretty decent paychecks as of, as of it is, but you know, you're tanking the sales of TMNT. You've created a character that a lot of people hate, so un unmemorable, I can't even remember the character's name at this moment. And uh, you've turned TMNT fans away. That's as far as indie books go. That's one of the biggest titles, has one of the biggest legacies in the entire industry. You're never ever gonna be able to shake that, right? That that legacy will, will be with Sophie Campbell forever moving forward. Once this time on Team and T and they reboot the entire thing happens, which is obviously inevitable at this point, and nobody will remember the amazing you know Team and T micro series that Sophie Campbell did before that, which is absolutely brilliant. And it's something that everyone should read that was associated with IDW. And when and the worst thing that happens is you know uh, these care these creators, um, Vidal included. There's another creator that actually has, has written good stories. If you go read Vidal's short story in Wonder Woman 750, I believe I gave it a five star. I said it was one of my um, ten best stories of 2020. It was absolutely fantastic. Another creator that is not allowed to grow as a writer is so pigeonholed uh, by gender identity, by racial identity, uh, by by tribalism, whatever tribes they belong to, they're not allowed to expand and go out and, and create great stories in any other with any other characters. When the few opportunities that happen, you know, it, it turns out okay. Not always. There are definitely some clunkers out there, but Vita Ayala's uh, pr career progression and personal growth as a writer has completely been stagnated by the terrible opportunities afforded so that DC and Marvel can shout the, the rooftops and virtue signal about how diverse their their creators are and how they match up with, with their characters. It's um and of course all these these once these creators have served their purpose and they don't sell you know, and besides Christopher Priest and, and Greg Pack, the other the, the writers I've talked about really, here really sell. Uh, although I think a couple of Sophie Cable's TMT &T issues did because they were right after uh, City at War. Maybe it was like 100 or whatever. But once they're they're of no use, you've you've already gotten your publicity, you've gotten your headlines, you virtue signaled using these uh, creators as the vessel to do it. So you can say we were never the problem and we're fixing the problem that we were never a part of, even though it was never the fans, it was the, the leadership. They are, they're going to discard you like, or discard these creators like, you know, tomorrow's garbage. Mags Asagio, Gabby Rivera, Kate left. There is a, a, a mountainous pile of, of less talented, but with potential writers, that, that had room to grow, that were completely stagnated because they were they were essentially cast based on you know their their ethnicity, their their gender identity, their their sexuality with these characters. They were never allowed to grow. They were never properly nurtured as as writers with good editorial staff or good mentorship to show them the ropes within the comic industry. They were given opportunities they didn't their, their work really didn't merit at that point, and they were eviscerated. They never sold anything. Their reputations were destroyed in the eyes of comic book readers, and then they were discarded. And the pile grows bigger and bigger every single month because in the end, the same people that you say were the problem, they were, that were in charge when, there was, when comics were only for white people, they're still in charge. They don't care about any of these people. They just care about the internet cloud. They they care about the headline. They they care about the virtue signal. At the end of the day, they don't care what effects they've had on Greg Pack, E viewing, V. I. Alice, Sophie Grace, Cena, uh, uh, Sophie Campbell, Cena Grace, Mags Asagio, G Gabby Rivera, Kate Less career. You know, they're they're left in the wake. Who cares? They've been used and discarded, and they will keep moving on. And that's too bad because a lot of these creators have shown immense amount of potential. They've had very good stories. 
people could say what they want about Max Visaggio. You can't, you can't, uh, you can't deny Jenny Hex. Whether you like that character or not, that's a good comic book. There's potential there. Unrealized potential because they were used, abused, and discarded by the industry that that claims they're changing things. That they they uh, you know the problem has always been that these stories were created for for white uh, for apparently an older white audience. I disagree with that assertion, but in creating that problem, fixing it, even though they were the problem to begin with, not us. Uh, they're absolutely destroying people's reputations and their future earning potentials, and I think that's uh, I think it's really sad. 